I'm Ksenia Khabarova from Lebedev Physical Institute of Russian Academy of Science, and today I'm going to tell you about cold atoms and ions and traps. And uh, we can consider this uh, very nice quantum technology like miracle. So let's start. What we are going to talk about today? Uh, first question is how to catch an atom or ion. Second is how to cool down atoms and ions in the trap and why. And uh, the last but not least, what for we need these trapped cold particles. Okay, let's start from the uh, one easy problem. So we know from the course of electricity that ion is a particle with a charge. So it's some atom which is lack of one or some number of electrons. And to understand how to catch it, we can uh, add some knowledge about the column interaction. So the charged particles will feel in other charged particles and thus we can influence it. And uh, just to have a feeling, uh, we need to understand what is the size of an atom or size of an ion. So the size is approximately on the order of 10 to minus 10 meters. And if we uh, compare the ion with an apple, then we can compare the apple with the earth. So this comparison will be more or less correct. So, uh, but we know from the initial theorem that uh, the collection of point charges cannot be maintained in stable stationary equilibrium configuration solely by the electrostatic interactions of charges. It means that we cannot just take some uh, charged part of metal and uh, surround the iron with such metal parts and make it uh, to be trapped, right? And this uh, some, somehow confined in the, in the space. It doesn't work. But uh, we can use uh, alternating, alternating uh, electric fields. And uh, we have a very nice um, picture how it works uh, even in the uh, mechanical model. Let's have a look on this uh, video. So this is a table, it rotates, and if it's stable, so it, with, without rotation, the ball will fall down from this uh, table. However, if it starts to rotate, you can see from this video that uh, the ball will be trapped in such a configuration. And if we talk about the alternating ele electric fields, we can consider it the same way. So we have, uh, for example, four rods, Two of them will be grounded, and two other will be with a radio frequency electric field, which will alternate uh, from the minus uh, amplitude to the plus amplitude, and it's it will be very similar to the to our rotating table, and the ion which we put in such alternating field will feel the same like a ball on this rotating table, and it will be catched. Okay, so we understand that uh, to catch an ion, we need such alternating electric fields and how to make it. Uh, there are some different uh, possible solutions. First, ion traps can be 3D or surface traps. So we can uh, take, like in previous uh, slide, we can take just four rods or maybe not rods, but blades and uh, applying uh, smartly, applying uh, electric fields, we can catch an ion in such a trap. And it means that we use 3D uh, trap. Otherwise, we can use surface trap. And let's have a look on another uh, video. So as you can see, the ion flies under the uh, surface trap. And one can control its position with, uh, alter with uh, electric fields. We can apply different types of electric fields to make the ions move and uh, go closer to each other, then we can do something with them, with a laser, for example, and then again uh, control their position. So this is very high technology. It's already uh, has uh, development for many years. It's uh, close to microelectronics. Okay, what we need? What we want to have? We want to have such a nice um, string of ions and to crystalline such an ensemble, we need to cool down the 
ions to the temperature of very close to absolute zero. However, we are smart, we are smart people, we have to ask ourselves one, one very important question. What is the temperature of a single ion? When we talk about temperature in our uh, usual life, we talk about the thermometer, which can be put some, somewhere and we can read uh, the number on it and then we know the temperature of the environment of, of a body or something, of some liquid and so on. And when we have only one particle, what do we mean when we talk about the temperature? And actually it's a very uh, tricky question because from the point of view of uh, thermodynamics, the concept of temperature, strictly speaking, is uh, applicable only for a large number of particles which are already in a thermal equilibrium. Otherwise, we cannot talk about temperature. Another, um, maybe you heard about it, uh, if the ensemble is in Maxwell distribution, so if the uh, motion of these uh, particles in the ensemble can be um, described with uh, Maxwell distribution, then we can talk about the temperature, because the temperature uh, very closely connected to the um, entropy. And the entropy is something about thermal dynamics, thermal motion. So it means that if we talk about uh, one single particle, we have to distinguish which, is, uh, which motion of its particle uh, depends on the thermal kinetic energy and which one is not the thermal kinetic energy. Uh, for understanding, let's consider this uh, very nice picture about supersonic flow of particles. You know, it's particles which go in one direction with a very high velocity. Uh, but actually, in this case, uh, if you have a look on this picture, on the upper part, then you can see the divergence of this flow is very, very low. And it means that the temperature of these particles is really low. Also, the velocity of the directed uh, motion is very high. So when we talk about the particle, we can, let's say, use the term of uh, temperature to describe the thermal motion of this particle. If we have an ion in a trap, then it's already trapped, so it has no directional uh, motion. Then we can consider temperature like, uh, let's say, uh, thermal kinetic energy, which we can divide in two parts according to the axis. Okay, I've uh, written down here on this slide some uh, constants, which we need to understand what uh, we can use when we uh, cool down the iron with a laser. So we need uh, Planck constant, uh, speed of light, uh, frequency, energy of the particle, and momentum. So radiation, we can consider radiation as a flow of particles, photons. And each photon has momentum, energy, and frequency or wavelength, which is uh, almost the same. So uh, let's have a look on this. Again, we know from the school the Bohr model of atom. So in this uh, model, each atom has an electron, and uh, this uh, electron can have only certain energy values. And uh, this energy quantized. Which, what, what does it mean? So if we have a photon with uh, some energy and it uh, goes to the atom, atom can absorb this uh, photon if the energy of the photon coincides with the difference of energy levels. And thus, atom has this additional energy and the electron goes from the uh, lower energy state to a high energy state. So it increases the energy of the orbits. If uh, the state, the excited state decays, then the photon takes the extra energy out of the atom and we have a photon with the energy of uh, difference between these energy states and again an atom with lower energy. So let's have a look on this example. We have a man on a cart which sits on the cart and the cart moves and we have a flow of apples, which this man catches. 
So the man catches apples flying towards him and then scatters them in some directions, in all directions, without any preferable direction, let's say. And the velocity of the atom is again the same when uh, the man catch it, catch that. So what it means that in every act of uh, catching an apple, uh, a man gets some uh, energy and momentum, right? And uh, we know that uh, the difference of the momentum before the act of catching apple and after it uh, will be different. So the atom, or not, not atom, our apple, which man catches, uh, will change the momentum of the man on the cart. And uh, I've written it here on, the, uh, on this uh, very, very simple equations. So if uh, we consider the velocity of the apple to be approximately one meter per, sec per second and uh, mass of the man about 100 kilos and the mass of the apple about 100 grams and the cart has a velocity of one meter per, sec per second, then every act of catching an apple will change the momentum of the cart by one thousandth of meter per second, per second. So to stop the cart, man has to catch at least thousand of apples. And again, it's very important that uh, when the man has this apple, he throw it away in some some random direction. And then after averaging over all directions, the uh, changing in the momentum by these acts will be zero. So iron do, does the same. It scatters millions of photons per second in this act. So just let's have a look further. So if we have an iron which has some motion and a photon, we have, for example, two um, contrary cases. So in the first uh, upper part of the uh, picture, we can see that the photon goes towards the atom or ion, which uh, has some velocity. And then in the coordinate system of a laboratory, the frequency of a photon will be lower than the frequency which will see the atom. And then this energy may be enough to excite an atom or ion, which is the same. And then the excited state will decay. Again, it will be some random direction. So in, in uh, averaging, it will be zero. Or maybe another uh, case when the photon goes after the um, ion and then the energy of this photon from the uh, point of view of atom is not enough to excite uh, it to the upper state and then uh, ion just doesn't see any photon and uh, nothing happens. And again, we have to remember this is a Doppler effect. So when we hear the car which goes towards us, the sound has the higher frequency. When the car goes from us further and further, the frequency will go lower and lower. So the Doppler effect and it will also work out for the atom and the light, so the photon. Okay, uh, just a little bit of formulas. Laser cooling. The same uh, thing happens with an atom or ion or when we have two-level atomic system, like we see on, the, on this uh, small video, and optical field. Atom could be in one, in one of two states. It can be either in a ground state or an excited state. And then uh, this excited state somehow decays after, after some time. It's not important at the moment. So when the atom absorbs uh, the photon, and you can see when uh, at atom goes towards uh, the photon, the photon starts to be more blue. And if it goes further from the it goes um, from the from the photon, the frequency of the font, photon for atoms should become red. So we again have to remember about two fundamental laws: energy conservation and momentum conservation. And here we uh, write it down. Okay, 
we have to remember about the difference between ener energy states, so excited and then ground states, and Doppler effect and recoil energy, which always have uh, to be there because the photon has a momentum, so it, it will be recoil. And two processes we can uh, consider is absorption and radiation. In the end, I didn't uh, want to stop here on the very complicated stuff, but we have some limit for the cooling. So we cannot cool down the atom to the absolute zero because we always have this um, uh, equilibrium between Doppler effect, which we can uh, control, and the recoil energy, which we cannot do anything with it. So there is some uh, very def defined, very good defined uh, thermal limit for the exactly uh, this transition, which we can use to cool down an atom. Okay, so we were talking about ions because ions uh, allow us to use uh, column interaction to first trap them in the, in the ion trap and then cool down with the laser with the laser using the Doppler effect. So the next question, how to trap an ion? So first of all, we need a source of ions and uh, it may be atomic oven. Talking about ions, it's the same uh, second question, but it's a little bit easier because ions we can produce inside the trap just if we have the same atomic uh, flow. So atomic oven, we need to uh, evaporate the atoms and have a flow of atoms. And of course, these atoms, because we need uh, to uh, heat the piece of metal, for example, it will be with a very high speed, right? So first we have to somehow to slow them down because no uh, existing, existing today uh, traps don't allow us to catch a very, very high speed uh, atoms. So first we need to slow them down. We again use the Doppler effect, which we already remember. And another one which we need is the Zeeman effect. So again, not going far from the uh, school course to the, some very complicated atomic physics, we just have to know, believe me, that the resonance of the atom is rather narrow. And uh, when we have a flow of atoms and a laser beam which uh, slowed it down due to the Doppler effect, after several acts of uh, uh, absorption and again, our radiation, the atom will be a little bit slower than in the beginning, but it will not be in resonance with this laser beam already. So what we need? We need something else, and this is the Zeeman effect. So when we have um, a magnetic field, the energy in the atom will move. So it will depend on the uh, value of the magnetic field. And then if we are smart enough and we can calculate the Zeeman slower, so it's some uh, combination of, um, let's say, mm, magnets, which form some uh, gradient of the magnetic field. So it's some, some magnetic field which will be changed from one uh, point of space to another along the axis of the uh, atomic beam. Then we can make uh, the, uh, our, during the process of laser slowing, we can uh, coincide the energy difference between two levels with the um, rate of the laser cooling. So with this uh, Zeeman slower, we can slow down the, the whole flow of atoms to the um, velocities approximately from 1 to 30 meters per second. And it's very good because in this case, we already can uh, trap them in a magneto-optical trap. So this is a little bit too uh, complicated to explain uh, just for, for the score, uh, school course. So we just believe in, the, um, in this picture. So the magneto-optical trap consists of three pairs of uh, laser light and two uh, magnetic coils, which produce the quadratic um, magnetic field and it uh, makes the forces which actually kick the atoms to the center of the trap where a magnetic field is 
zero. And then to the uh, right, we can see very nice cloud of cold uh, atoms, uh, which are just fly inside the vacuum chamber. And it's a number of these atoms, it's millions of them. So what we need, again, of course, it's a very high vacuum and the laser and the magnetic field and to slow down the atoms beforehand. So, okay, we can, let's go back to the question of temperature. This, in this case, we have an ensemble of atoms. Can we actually judge about the temperature? And how we can judge about the temperature? Again, we have nothing to put there inside the vacuum chamber to measure it. Because anyway, we are talking not about the uh, temperature in our usual point of view. So, for example, this is the strontium atoms, which are uh, catched into the trap. And to um, estimate the temperature, we again look at the motion. And uh, to uh, consider it, to understand it, we just let the cloud to fall down. This is the um, picture, so this is a photo of the cloud, how it falls down and actually ballistically expand. So the ballistic expansion gives us uh, the result which we can judge about the temperature. And on this small video, you can see how it actually goes down. And these falling, we do not take into account because it's directional motion uh, due to the gravitational field. And the only thing which we are interested in is the expansion. So the expansion gives us the uh, judge about the temperature. So this is a very cold atoms, which you can see, because the temperature is about 35 microkelvins. It's very, very cold atoms. Okay, when we have such a low temperature, we can do the next step and trap atoms into optical lattice. Optical lattice is a standing wave. You have two lasers, which just go towards each other. And we have the uh, standing wave. And we can catch the atom, every atom, in some minimum of this light, uh, of the standing wave. Why, again, it's a little bit too complicated question, but believe me, we can. And thus we have a very nice number of, uh, like, say, the pancakes of atoms, which are uh, located in a very uh, good uh, oriented way. Okay, so uh, the last thing which I wanted to tell you about is what for we need all these cold particles. So we understand that we can trap them, we can cool them down, we can cool them down very low to very low temperatures. We can put some some optical lattice with them. And uh, what for? What is the reason? First of all, because it's a beautiful physics. One of the very beautiful experiments which were made uh, last uh, 50 years, it's a Bose-Einstein Condensate, condensate, which was demonstrated even in space. What it means? When we have the thermal atoms to the left, uh, and we just have a look how it expands, so it's isotro isotropic expansion. And the Bose-Einstein condensa condensate, which uh, we can produce if we go to very, very low temperatures, with a very, very high density of the atoms, and of course it should be bosons. Then they can uh, occupy the same energy level, and then we can see that uh, because of the an anisotropic confinement in the magnetic trap, it will expand differently. It will be not the isotropic expansion. So, what for we need the Bose-Einstein condensate? Uh, it's it's really difficult to say because some practical applications they were not found at the moment. But it's uh, first of all, it's interesting. Second, it's beautiful, and it illustrates really that the quantum mechanics works. Okay, what what else? Uh, operating with the cold atoms in such uh, object like optical lattice, we have uh, an ability to make an array of uh, atoms and uh, collect them in any picture we want. What for? For example, it can be a quantum simulator or quantum sensor or quantum computer. Next, 
and a very it's a very important uh, application because with the uh, cold atoms and ions we can make uh, make an optical atomic clock and the optical atomic clock is the most accurate and stable device in the world to the, today so the uh, accuracy and stability of such clock reached already 10 to minus 18 in relative uh, units so what it means that uh, these such clocks will have the error of one second during the time more than life of our universe so it's really extremely accurate device and uh, on this picture you can see what it consists of so we need uh, of course atoms like here in the lattice for example it's a neutral uh, neutral atoms we need a laser to ask the atoms about the frequency of their transition inside it so the transition should be really very strictly forbidden to uh, make the possibility of the excitation of this um, transition only when the laser is very very accurately coincide with this uh, transition and uh, we need uh, something like extra lasers, some, some electronics and so on. And of course, uh, the laser should be stable. So the uh, spectral line width of the laser should be very, very narrow. So our atoms in the uh, vacuum chamber should be as isolated as possible from the environment. They should not feel any uh, thermal radiation any magnetic field any electric field everything should be controlled and then we have the same it's a, a big amount of uh, the same same um, particles which are the same here the same in africa the same in brazil and everywhere it will be everywhere the same particles and then when we ask them so the main question of the clock is comparison just like comp comparison of the clocks is the basement of the uh, timekeeping. So we can, can, can compare these um, clocks from one lab to another and then we see that uh, how, how we can control everything around us. Like this optical clock, they can be used for many fundamental and uh, practical applications. The most bright of them is uh, navigation. So if you have the um, GLONASS or GPS or Baidu or anything else uh, with solid uh, space apparatus, uh, apparatus and they have uh, some clocks on it and we have the clocks on the earth and we can compare them and then we can very accurately uh, measure and uh, define our location on the on the earth okay what else quantum computer so atoms and uh, ions today are considered as the basement for the quantum computing and what uh, lays down in this uh, in this question is that the quantum computer is um, somehow very similar to uh, usual computer but the encoding of the information is different. In the regular computer, we just use zeros and uh, ones, like uh, two bits, to encode the information. And in the quantum computer, we use so-called qubits, when we encode the information in the state of the quantum particles. And of course, we can use it we can do it only if we have a very well-defined quantum particles. Talking about ions, we have a string which do not move and we can uh, address every ion individually. And of course, it's uh, talking about the uh, future. The ion quantum computer is one of the most promising over all the uh, platforms already existing. And... Um, the most powerful quantum computer today is based on the cold ions in ion traps. What else? Let's have a look here. We can measure gravitational potential using the optical clock because the atoms are very, very sensitive. And if we isolate them from the environment, then we can ask them about the frequency of their uh, transitions, depending on in what uh, gravitational potential it's uh, located 
and it allow us to build a map of the gravitational potential and for example make a uh, map of geoid last uh, which i would like to maybe not not last but very interesting part is the search for dark matter and energy you know this uh, there is a problem that from the very beginning we cannot understand why the universe consists only of uh, five percent of visible matter and where everything else we cannot find it yet but we know that there is a lot of dark matter and enormous part of dark energy but we cannot feel it maybe cold atoms and ions will help us to do it and uh... Last, which I wanted to just to mention, is the quantum sensors. If you have a very cold atom, then you can control all these um, states of the energy and you can excite it in a very, very high energy level. And in this uh, state, it will be very sensitive to many other um, environmental fields, like electric fields, like magnetic fields. So you can use very cold particles like a sensor with a very, very high accuracy. And of course, there are many other. Thank you.